So uh, we're going to bring up the panel. We're going to talk about elbow. The guys who talk about elbow are sort of like the awkward younger brothers of the, of the shoulder surgeons. This morning's been tremendous. I, I'm a hand and upper extremity guy, so 50% uh, hand, 25% elbow, about 25% shoulder. Have learned a tremendous amount this morning. So uh, this is just a, a wonderful meeting that's chocked full of nice pearls. I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to the content. And we've got some great people up here. We've got Greg Bennett, who is a, uh, a PT, uh, Gabe Horniff, uh, Russ Huffman, both from uh, Philadelphia, and then the big dog in the room uh, for Elbow is Bob Hotchkiss. And I'm 30 years in, and most of the stuff that I've learned that's innovative with Elbow has uh, come at his hands. So uh, because of that, I made up a Hotchkiss grading system for the cases. A one is a pass in the flat, a two is an overhead grab in traffic, a three is a diving catch on the sideline, and a four is a one-hander in the end zone with coverage. So um, I did get orders about how I should comport myself and what the, the, the panelists should do. They basically said, you know, try to um, minimize protracted confabulation and get to your point as quickly as possible. <laughs> And so we're going to try and do that. So the first case is a 53-year-old police chief, three-year history of progressive stiffness, pain locking. Uh, he's got a 55 to 105 degree arc of motion, normal form rotation. He's got a tunnels over his ulnar nerve. His big issues as the chief are uh, working out, bench press, and anything that involves placing an object above head. He had an injection that worked for a few months, and Bob. Uh, before we treat this guy surgically, the insurance company is asking him if you sent this patient to PT. No. No. And, and why not? He's got door stops. Right. Uh, not going to work. It's going to be uncomfortable. So imaging, uh, you can see that this guy has uh, a picture of synovial chondromatosis with uh, osteoarthritis of his own humeral joint. He's got rated capitellar arthritis. Uh, Gabe, more imaging on this one? Uh, I didn't think we were allowed to ask for more imaging, but... Um, well, yeah. I get to ask you if okay. you want okay. more imaging. <laughs> right. That uh, is my prerogative. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I would likely get a CT on this just to get a better understanding. Yeah, so advanced imaging for me in a stiff elbow is for deformity, for extracapsular bone, and, and when you're trying to work this out. So here's an example of a lot of HO uh, in conjunction with a stiff elbow. I, I generally will get a CT in that setting. This is a 53-year-old different guy with stiffness seven months after his olecranon was fixed. Um, here are his plain films. Um, Russ, can you release this and get this to move? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, there's some incongruity at the uh, ulnohumeral joint that you're going to have to deal with, and then um, your at least one of your ligaments on the prior radiograph was ossified. So I would I would have a graft available to yeah. reconstruct the ligaments as needed. But you, you'd agree this is more like a Hotchkiss three or four than a Hotchkiss one, right? So I would because of the incongruity. Right, right. and so yeah. you, what's going to happen in this case is you're going to get in there, you're going to open it up. And as you move it, there's going to be a cam effect. And that cam effect is going to bite you on the back end. It's, it's going to be harder to maintain. So in that instance, uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, elbow contractures, I do think CT scans are better. But uh, in general, even in some of the simpler cases, if you're starting to do these either open or arthroscopically, I do think that they give you guidance. So you can see here, um, there's normally a nice little sulcus behind the capitellum that the radial head seats itself into. And in this particular case, there's a heterotopic bone back there that you're going to need to clear. And then you can see the Mickey Mouse ears that are coming off the tip of the olecranon and the bone in the olecranon fossa. So I do think it can be helpful. There's five different approaches for this. And let me just ask you guys uh, down the line, Russ, your, your preferred approach for this N not the olecranon fracture, but the first case, the police chief. Yeah, I would, uh, my preferred would be arthroscopic. However, uh, I have no problem doing like a medial over the top uh, approach from yeah. Bob. Perfect, Bob. Yeah, I wouldn't bother with the arthroscope because there's just so much bone and I can do it open in about 30 minutes. Yeah. I can't set up the scope that fast. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, how about and, and you have to transpose the nerve. The nerve has to be transposed. Great, great point, Gabe. 
Uh, I was going to say the same thing. So the fact that they have nerve symptoms uh, would push me to go medial over the top. Okay. Um, otherwise, I usually try to go lateral just because there's less things to get into danger with. Great. Uh, but the bottom line with this is, is you have to know all of these approaches. And if, if you're not, haven't done them recently, you can get access to a cadaver in, in one of your local uh, vendor labs. Do that so that you can go medial, you can go lateral, you can go medial over the top, whatever you need to do to be able to uh, change midstream if you have to. My least favorite approach is the straight posterior approach, and my it's my least favorite because when they develop a seroma postoperatively, it kind of screws the pooch. You have to slow everything down, and, and it's, I think they're harder to rehab. Um, indications for ulnar nerve decompression for you, like Russ? In situ decompression? Uh, trans, uh, so um, releasing with or without transposition. So post-traumatic elbows uh, or where there may be some adhesions in the floor of the cubital tunnel and, and a lack of ulnar nerve excursion uh, means that I'm going to move the nerve out. And, and uh, when I was with Sean uh, Driscoll, uh, we looked at a series of his patients, and there, there is some delayed onset ulnar neuropathy in some of these patients who are asymptomatic preoperatively. So my threshold was very low. Um, I have no problem moving or decompressing the nerve. I'm not as big of a fan of an in situ if I think I'm going to also create some uh, exposed bone near the nerve. I want to get the nerve away from that. So You want a nice surface for that guy to move back and forth on. And so we're not allowed to quote articles, but this is a, a study that Dean Satirianis and I did. Most of his patients were open. Most of mine were arthroscopic. It was a pretty good series. And basically what we saw is that if you had no symptoms pre-op and you started with less than 100 degrees of elbow flexion, there's a 15% chance that you're going to have subsequent symptoms that would require surgery. And so for me, that's the cutoff, 100 or less. Um, so extension contractures. The other thing when we're trying to get flexion back uh, is uh, releasing that post-remedial bundle. And so I did this arthroscopically. I do in a lateral position. Start with the nerve because he had symptoms. Uh, lateral approach first. Uh, uh, this is the view that we get. You can see all these uh, loose bodies from his synovic chondromatosis. Uh, go pretty quickly to a switching stick, get a direct medial portal, um, and from that medial portal, uh, get yourself an anterolateral retractor portal, and then uh, shave without suction. This is another Sean O'Driscoll move that I love in, in a tight elbow. Uh, so what he does is he puts in a, uh, your trocar and peels up that anterolateral capsule, and that's a real blow for freedom when it comes to your view. Let your retractor do a much better job. Lots of stuff in the elbow. Take soft tissues off the osteophytes. Burr. And then another little pearl that I think is helpful for me um, is to use the electric cautery only when uh, you can see to put it directly up against bone, but it can be very helpful. And then another little pearl is I like taking off the tip of the coronoid with an osteotome. I think it just speeds things along. Leave yourself a little hinge, obviously, so you can grab it and it, it doesn't become a floater. Uh, you, some people believe capsulotomies are safer from medial to lateral. I usually still go uh, lateral to medial. Posterior portals, clear the fossa, inspect the gutter, and then release that posterior medial bundle. And I'm doing that in conjunction with the ulnar nerve, but I'm just sort of showing you what those fibers look like and how they can restrict flexion. So Gabe, we can't get full extension. We think it's the result of a, a shortened uh, brachialis. This is an issue probably more in the post-traumatics where we're, you know, we're, we're still at, at 40 or 50 degrees after doing our soft tissue release. Is there any role for myotomy? You, you wrote about this in uh, spastic hemiplegia, but how about in, uh, in these cases? Yeah, I mean, I think you can almost do sort of like a pie crust thing. I wouldn't want to take it all down completely, but try to get some, some length out of it. Yeah. I think uh, it's because you did it arthroscopically. Yeah. Actually, it was perfect. You'll see. Uh, now, Bob. I just want to make the point. But, but the elbow are, gets we're going to get to it, Bob. Here we are. Here we are. No, the elbow gets swollen from this, and people don't know what to do. That Actually, you do. it doesn't, Bob. Yeah. You keep your pressures low, and at the end of... I can do one of these myself in about an hour. I usually take a fellow through it. It takes about an hour, 45 minutes. At the end of that, the, the elbow's not swollen if you keep your pressures low. But everything else you say is right. <laughs>
So you already answered this question. I love showing these videos, but ultimately doesn't matter if you do any of these cases open or arthroscopically. Look, I do, I scope a lot of elbows. And, and if, if you just get rid of the doorstop, it, it's just so much easier, just osteotome, done, see the ulnar nerve, go up to the front, done. And, and what I find, I, I redo a lot of contracture releases that people attempted. This room, you're exempt from this comment. Um, but there are a lot of people who try it and they don't know how to do them open. To your point, yeah. you need to know how to do them open before you do them in the scope because that's your fallback. So I just want you to see what's happening here now. I'm about to be attacked on both flanks by a New Yorker, right? <laughs> I'm from no. Pittsburgh. We don't know how to rumble the way these guys do. No attack. Actually, yeah. I want to learn from you guys. So I struggle arthroscopically figuring out where the osteophyte ends and the native bone begins. So especially yeah. posteriorly on the ulna, where the olecranon flare of the Mickey Mouse ears turns into the regular electron. So what pearls do you guys have to help us figure that out via the scope? Yeah, so the bottom line is that uh, you, the, the capsule is pretty easy to take down, and then you're at triceps. So you very quickly clear that little bit of stuff that's right on the top of the electron and go to that point. And uh, you don't have to make a hole in the electron in general. Uh, most of the time, you can see the demarcation between cortical bone and HO bone, I think. That's a, that's a pearl that, I, when I was with Sean, that <clears throat> one of the many pearls that I learned from him. Even when we did total shoulders, any, any HO he took out, whether it was osteophyte or uh, post-traumatic heterotopic bone, and certainly in his osteocapsular arthroplasties, he made a point of always finding the capsular uh, junction with the heterotopic bone and you can actually see and you can see it in the subacromial space as well when you have a subacromial spur you'll see I try to show the fellows uh, you'll see a nice striation between ectopic bone and kind of periosteum or, or capsule mm -hmm. and Sean would recreate the native joint like I'm not able to uh, radiographically it would, it would go from a messed up looking elbow to looking normal radiographically and he followed that principle, and I've, I've done that, not to his skill level, but, but uh, it's, it's worth maybe talk, grabbing him at a meeting or something and having him show you one of his videos of doing that. But yeah. um, it's like a, a road you can follow. So Russ, you still got the mic. Anything else for these guys, postoperatively, steroids, Botox? No, I think it's important. What, what we've started doing, and it's because our anesthesia is really good at our outpatient surgery center, is... We do an indwelling uh, catheter. I get them to therapy. They go from the fifth floor to the second floor and start therapy the same day. Get them right on. And it. part of it's a psychological thing because then they see that they have motion they haven't had in years, and, and I think it emboldens them to kind of keep pushing. That's huge, isn't it? In the recovery room, to sit down there with the family, they can take a video if they want. Greg, I'm sending you this guy a little bit later at day five. Uh, how long will you work with him until talking about static progressive splinting? Well, I am a fan of the splints, uh, yeah. especially when needed. To me, it would be more dependent upon his pro progress. If, yeah. if I'm getting 10 degrees a week and he's not in a lot of discomfort, I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to be required. You're not going to need it, yeah. And if, if you do think you need it and you can't get insurance approval for it, what do you tell him? Well, we're fortunate in our situation to have ability to customize in the clinic. So you can fabricate it yourself. Right. So for you guys, eBay, right? These got people use this stuff and then they post it, 50 bucks. And so this is him at his first post-operative visit. He's not all the way straight. He's got good flexion though. He's got good form rotation. Uh, and so the take home with the, these simple contractures that there's lots of approaches, be prepared to do something other than what you planned. So we're gonna go to a Hotchkiss two. A 70-year-old distal biceps repair on a non-dominant arm. Uh, developed a large firm mass in the proximal forearm. The doctor took care of him and said, this is normal. It'll, it'll uh, melt away over time. A year later, this is, uh, are his images. Uh, he's referred to me at that point. He's got discomfort. He's got a decrease in elbow flexion depending on pronation and decreased form rotation. There's the lump. Here's his supination and pronation. And you can see with his forearm pronated, he can't fully flex, but with supinated, when that lump gets out of the way, he can. This is his MRI that he came in with. This is a CT that I got. 
Bob, does HO, this was through an anterior approach, I sort of showed you that, it was the a tendon dunked in the bone with a, a button on the back side. Uh, does HO after two incision look different? No, it, it happens with both approaches. Yeah, but, but do you, have you seen the posterolateral bone form with the two incision as opposed to the anterior stack? Um, again, I've seen it both ways, and that actually happens a lot. Yeah, it's, it does. And, and sometimes it wipes out the radial nerve as it grows. Interesting, I've not seen that. Uh, Gabe, your surgical approach for this one, he had an anterior approach before. You're going to go back through that anterior approach? Yeah, I, I mean, his bone is pretty prominent right there. I don't see a reason to try to take some circuitous route to get there. Yeah. I would make sure I'd try to find the lateral endobrachial cutaneous first and foremost and just have that wrapped in a vessel loop yeah. and then uh, start going at it. Yeah, and then, uh, Russ, uh, you take all this down and it, uh, your biceps is flapping in the breeze. Is this something in general that you're going to... Uh, repair and flexion, or are you going to graft it? Uh, graft 100% of the time. Yeah. And so I, I think it's, uh, I think there, there are, are times when it's possible that you might not have to graft it, but not having it in the room is bad on you, and, and you don't want to be in that situation. Um, and so this was uh, the dissection, went through an anterior approach. There's that stack of bone, and surprisingly, the biceps was still on. I, I was not expecting that from the MR. I guess I didn't have fine enough cuts to be able to, to see it going down to bone. Was able to get it out pretty easily. Uh, Gabe, do you use Indocin after uh, primary biceps repairs? I do. I put them on um, sustained release for about 10 days uh, yeah. afterwards. Um, in this case, I might consider doing a low-dose radiation before taking them back just right. to hedge my bets. Um, yeah, so the Indocin yeah. does seem to uh, be beneficial. Ruby Greewald did a nice paper on that. And then, so I did the same thing. Um, actually, just so you guys know, uh, Indocin SR is relatively expensive. Uh, Indocin 25 TID is almost free. Um, and so if someone has a crappy insurance plan, as we have in Pittsburgh, it's a nice little thing. Um, so he's got improved motions, pain's gone. These are his post-operative radiographs. I left a little bit behind but uh, nice rotation now, and nice flexion, even in pronation. And amazingly, uh, his extension improved a lot, which I wasn't expecting. And Mark Cohen looked up a series of patients that he had done as primary repairs versus instances where he, he took out bone, did single dose radiation and endomethacin, and both cohorts were excellent. So we're gonna go to a Hotchkiss three. 51-year-old with uh, dry rheumatoid arthritis. So she sort of burned out, had been on meds uh, for a, a number of years, and then it uh, kind of cooked itself out. I did a synovectomy with a radial head resection on her. And this I'm now part of the Radial Head Preservation Society. Uh, particularly in rheumatoids, you do not want to take out the head uh, because they will collapse in valgus and they'll trash their medial ulnar humeral joint, as I'll show you. But she's hurting a lot. She's been through a non-operative treatment. This is kind of what I did to her. I don't know if, the, um, if I can get a pointer going on this, but uh, if you look at her medial ulnar humeral joint, it is worse than her lateral ulnar humeral joint, and that's because I took out her radial head, and in a person with inflammatory arthritis, there's gonna be attenuation of the, that medial capsule along with the MCL. So this, uh, I, I, I feel badly about this. But that, that was what we did in the 90s, um, was an accepted treatment. So I did uh, look at this arthroscopically. She had uh, essentially no bone in her ulnar humeral joint. And so for the team, this woman's 51. We'll just run down the list real quickly. Interpositional arthroplasty for you, Gabe? Probably arthroplasty. Arthroplasty, Bob? Uh, because she's not beyond the Larson three, in the, you have to discuss this. If you do an implant, you've crossed the Rubicon. If it fails, it's a mess. So I've done about 20 interpositions over the last 20 years, so it's one a year. Yeah. So the, for the right patient, they've, they've lasted. I haven't converted any to totals. Yeah, and a, and a little bit better results in the rheumatoids, right? Much better. So, yeah, and even so it's Bernie an reported it unknowingly. Yeah, yeah. So for you, Russ? Yeah, I think uh, I would have a discussion with the patient. I, I'm, I may not be as great at interpositions. I mean, I've, I've had some success, but not, it's not consistent for me. Yeah. So, um, so I would definitely let the patient know that. I think if I was going to do an arthroplasty, I'd probably use the implant that Bob's 
develop, which is cementless and unconstrained. Yeah. So. And so uh, you answered my question. Great. Anybody do a hemi in this setting? Yeah, not a, not a, probably not a good idea in a, in a rheumatoid in general. And overall, the results have been kind of crappy. If interposition frame or no frame, Bob? You, you, you taught me that I, I watched you do this in 1990 and was in <laughs> awe of you putting yeah. that frame on so quickly. You and, know, but how about now? I, I'm not sure the distraction matter. I, I, by the way, I can't figure out why these patients do well yeah. anyway. So I, I want to make that uh, you know, position clear. Um, so, and I do think the DMARDs have had a big influence because I think that's what led to the rapid destructions of the joint. So the, yeah. with that caveat. So um, I now use a frame that's a little simpler if they're unstable, mm -hmm. but I've also done them without a frame if, and I keep the lateral side intact and I keep the medial side intact. So I don't take the ligaments down. Interesting, okay. And material for interposition, Bob? I just use an Achilles allograft. Achilles, great. And so in, in uh, this particular person, she'd had a transposition of her ulnar nerve. I actually, uh, this is an arthroscopically assisted technique that I'm gonna show you. It's a little bit of a techno fest, but I actually think it, it uh, can work out nicely. So to, to, to do the scope, you have to find her nerve and then you can still uh, safely create a medial portal. Uh, one of the keys to it is that I do burr out the fossa here so that I can pass sutures to secure the graft centrally. And so this is uh, here going through back to front. I actually have uh, taken off the LUCL, so I gotta see how you do it without taking off the LUCL. But you can hinge open the elbow, you can release your anterior and posterior capsule uh, to get them back their uh, motion. Use a suture to measure the dimensions from medial to lateral and then again from uh, posterior to anterior, and use that to fashion your graft. And then there's uh, six sutures, an anteromedial, postromedial, anterior central, posterior central, anterolateral, posterolateral. And you, you pass the anteromedial sutures just through that lateral window, uh, bring it around the corner. You retrieve the anteromedial sutures, again, just by uh, passing with a hemostat, and tuck them under the nerve. The postromedial one, uh, do with arthroscopic assistance, and you can see it come out here. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to maintain my medial collateral ligament, and so I'm passing these sutures on either side of it. The anterior central sutures are here, posterior central coming in through the back, and then you can just sort of slide this thing in, shuttle the graft into place, tie the sutures medially, posteriorly, uh, and then on the lateral side, uh, you need to drill holes for your lateral complex so that you can repair that and then pull that graft up proximally and tie it over an anchor so it doesn't sag. And you splint these guys for 10 days. They're in a hinge brace. And I published a really small series on these, just four patients. And to your point, Russ, unpredictable. Three out of four did nicely. One person uh, did horribly and did badly even after I converted her to a total elbow. It, which, by the way, the post-traumatics do much worse right. than the inflammatory you're, patients. You're, you're right on. So we have time to get to my Hotchkiss 4, and this is an 11-year-old with a radial neck fracture. She has a synostosis that's taken down, regains full motion, has recurrent synostosis, and is referred to me at that point. And I said, I got this. I know what to do. Bob, what would you do in this instance? Um, this actually happens a lot. Um, I, I bet I've seen it at least nine times or something along those lines, especially with earlier. So um, if you go back to the, Im well, I won't make you do that. So when you see this really mature, you know, bone, it's different than just a block like the biceps thing. Yeah. And, and so it's much more challenging. So you have to be ready. You have to actually create a space in there. And we interpose, I interpose the Ancaneus so it wraps all the way around. You actually have to tie it to the biceps insertion so that it pulls it around and stays in there. In adults who have this, you can put an implant in and, and you just re, it's so great because it pulls the radius away from the ulna um, and you don't have to worry about the capitellum and it just resurfaces as the PRUJ. Interesting. So I did that um, six months after her revision resection. Um, this is what she's got, looking really good. Then she comes back in at three years. She's now 15 years old. All of her rotation is through her wrist. 
re-recurrent synostosis. Damn it. Russ, now what? I sent him Bob. <laughs> Bob, now what? So, so I, I, this has happened to me. In fact, one came in I, last week. I gotta week. tell you, I feel so much better. No, this I This has girl, been a validating experience the, coming to DC. I, I, I had a nine year, I operated on a kid who was nine, she came in, she's 22 and has a kid, but she, she can't rotate her arm. But if you, again, go back to the bone. So now it's, it's kind of a different situation. And I think it has to, it, there's an age preference for this happening. Yeah. And so it's actually safer now to do it than it was earlier. Okay. And so what are we doing? Um, so if you can't, if you use the Ancaneus in the last one, now you're in a bind, but I can always, you can always find something in the neighborhood. But it's the same, you've got to put an interposition, a living interposition in there. Um, and in her, depending on how much, she's how old? She's now 15. 15, yeah. The other thing is to wait a little bit. Yeah. And say, look, you need to live with this until you're, you're completely, because I look at her distal humerus there. and yeah, you know, She was three and a half years out yeah. from my revision and said that she had just noticed it, but talking to her mom, she says, no, she's been using her arm differently for about a year. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the problem is, you're not sure sometimes in that age group, who's bringing the patient in? Is yeah. it the patient or, so I'm, you know, I'm, I don't mind waiting um, at all. So I, I did not think that I could do the same operation a third time. And so what I did is an operation that uh, Bernie Mori described, I, called him and talked to him and about seven other friends of mine who are, uh, who do a lot of this stuff. I, I may have called you, Bob. I don't know if I did or not. But basically, I uh, went back in. What I wanted to do is I wanted to do a resection, a proximal, basically salvic hepangy procedure, but I wanted to preserve her biceps insertion. And you can't see the tuberosity through a lateral approach uh, with her synostosis. So I made a cut then I could rotate the arm uh, enough that I could see the tuberosity. And then here's, uh, here's her synostosis, I left that alone, and then took out as much bone as I could, preserving the tuberosity so that she maintained her biceps insertion. And I gave her a little partial PIN palsy. Uh, her, she and her mom gave me permission to show you her image. I recommended radiation. Uh, the radiation oncologist gave her more than I recommended. Um, I'm just going to bounce through this because we're out of time. But she rocked this. All right? Looking awesome. Until 18 months later, her wrist hurts. I, I don't know how this happens. No, it's because it's more proximal. Yeah. So, well, I, I actually, I, I should have been distal to the insertion, but I was not happy. So I'm, uh, we're out of time, so I'm just going to show you that I did do an ulnar shortening osteotomy. I did an IOM reconstruction, for better or for worse. Got her back to neutral. She's now at six months. She doesn't have any pain for now. Did you make her wear that shirt for the picture? I didn't. That's <laughs> awesome, though, right? Stranger things. Yeah. So this, is, this has been truly confession for me. Thank you. If you have something and you want to throw it, Brad, you can throw it. But in the, in the last couple seconds, take home CT. If you're not sure, get comfortable with all five approaches to the elbow. Indocent helps, XRT for revisions, and have a solid relationship with a PT. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, Greg, Gabe, and Russ. <laughs> <laughs>